Hello everybody and welcome back to the lecture on computer graphics. In the last lecture, we had been discussing about uh, CRT displays and CRT monitors and specifically the uh, refresh raster displays. Okay? And uh, today, we will continue on that and try to wind up the discussion on uh, CRT displays. And uh, the three main concepts uh, with respect to the refresh raster displays, which is a point potting device unless unlike the line drawing or stroked displays, vector displays of random scan or DVST is that we basically draw points and we have to worry about video rates, refresh scan rate, uh, number of lines, time regarding vertical retrace, horizontal retrace. We talk of interlaced uh, fields. We also talked about uh, uh, the bandwidth about accessing a pixel, the uh, time for accessing a pixel to switch on and switch off the beam, controlling the beam. We talked about architectures. And finally, we also discussed about uh, the uh, direct relationship between the frame buffer, memory array of pixels, and uh, the spots on the screen. So, if we look back into the last slide which we discussed. Uh, in the last class, we were talking about a n bit plane gray level frame buffer, n bit plane gray level frame buffer. So, we visualize that a bit plane is a single bit, so there are n such uh, bits stacked, and uh, for corresponding to each pixel, there are n bits, or typically it could be 1 byte if n is equal to 8, and the contents, corresponding contents of that bits from those n uh, bit planes are stacked parallelly loaded onto an n bit register which fires a 2 to the power n DAC, a digital to analog converter which generates a corresponding voltage uh, proportional to the uh, digital value at the register. And the electronic gun gets that input and controls the strength of the electron beam which will go and strike the corresponding dot um, on the screen. Of course, we do not have to worry here about the uh, deflection voltages uh, generated by the video controller automatically uh, as the uh, beam is being scanned left to right and keeps going down with horizontal retrace and then of course, even on out fields, vertical retrace, diagonal retrace, all that is done automatically. And at the same time, at a given instant of time, when the deflection voltages, the horizontal and vertical deflection voltages allow the beam to strike at a particular point, corresponding to that, the intensity of that pixel is being taken out from the frame buffer and loaded onto a register, which in turn goes to the DAC and uh, fires the electron beam. Okay? Now, we have been talking about n bit, n equal to 3, 8, various configuration, bit plane when n is equal to 1, we have black and white. What about color? So, when we talk about color, we go to the uh, next slide from here. A simple color frame buffer can be done with n equal to 3. We talked about this in the last class that to implement a color, we cannot do this with a single gun. We need three separate guns for the three uh, fundamental color. We are talking of an RGB representation of a color image. There are of course, other representations which we will talk later on in the lecture about color models and color representation, but here we take just n equal to 3. That means, we are assigning just a single bit for an individual color. The red color has a single bit plane, the R and the G and the B also for the green and the blue. Uh, henceforth, we will talk of RGB as red, green, blue respectively a single bit plane for each individual color. So, if you look into the monitor now, the screen shows that uh, there are three such bit planes and the corresponding, uh, we assume here uh, that the corresponding bit values 0 or 1 only in this case is been taken out from the frame buffer, load onto a 1 bit register which in fact fires a DAC. The digital to analog converter will convert that bit value into a corresponding uh, voltage 0 or some non-zero value and the corresponding color guns. Now, we have these three color guns. We have been talking about one color gun so far. Now, the first time we are going to have three color guns separately for the three colors or three channels uh, of visibility. You can visualize R, green and blue. And what is done basically all the beams correspondingly from all the three guns simultaneously are fired onto one pixel point and this pixel we should also have three dots respectively for R, G and B and they will receive the corresponding uh, intensities of the guns 
and uh, illuminate a pixel which will appear as color. Okay, the CRST raster will have the same uh, resolution as the frame buffer, but each now each pixel has three dots. That's the uh, significant difference. We'll look into that as we go along. But before that, if we just use n equal to three, then n bit uh, plain uh, available frame buffer. In case of just one bit for each color frame buffer, we get eight colors. Now, if you are uh, uh, used to two tables uh, for n equal to three, there are eight possible values which one can hold in the frame buffer at each pixel position. So, we correspondingly have eight different colors and this table shows uh, the corresponding values of red, green and blue. The first row talks about red, green and blue all three zeros and we have the black color which is of course uh, very obvious because none of the uh, electronic guns are firing with an intensity the beam is switched off and the pixels also do not glow. So, we have black and at the bottom of the row when all of them burn simultaneously and uh, hits the corresponding three pixels, you have the white color. Okay? And in between you have other variations, of course, the pure blue and the green and the red corresponding to 001, 010 and 100 of the truth table for RGB respectively. And other mixtures of 011 uh, will create a cyan and a 101 will create a magenta. I have uh, labeled the corresponding uh, color with the, uh, the color value itself so that it gives you an idea. Uh, very nice illustration and uh, red green combination together 1 1 gives you uh, the yellow color. So, you typically can have 8 colors using just 3 n equal to 3, uh, 3 bit planes and this sort of uh, uh, getting 8 colors uh, uh, display was traditionally called an EGR extended graphics uh, adapter card which is to provide with an EGA display. Okay? Uh, well, we were talking about 3 dots on the screen which had to be fired by 3 different guns and this shows how it is implemented. Okay? So, we are talking of an operation of what is called a delta delta shadow mask CRT uh, and three electronic guns aligned with a triangular colored dot patterns on the screen uh, are directed to each dot triangle by a shadow mask. Okay? So, the beams from the three uh, electron guns which are also arranged in some triangular arrangement as like the colored dot patterns on the screen and the uh, beams come out the respective guns as you can see on the left hand side of the screen R, G and B will emit correspondingly uh, beams which uh, are uh, sensitive to R, G and B respectively and they actually pass through a shadow mask which allows the beam to pass through only that dot and hit the screen. The shadow mask arrangement does not allow uh, beams to go at any arbitrary angle and hit the screen. It is specifically aligned with the corresponding arrangement of what I will call as the magnified phosphor dot triangle, magnified for you to see it. Otherwise, almost it is not visible to the naked eye. You might use a lens and come very close to a CRT monitor to see each individual dots. That may be possible, but not visible to the naked eye. So, it has been zoomed and shown separately that that is a typical arrangement, a triangular arrangement of the three phosphor dot triangles and they respectively are sensitive to the color of the electron beam which is now fired by the respective guns. Okay? So, that is very, very important RGB and of course, uh, the screen is uh, full of such dots. So, selection of shadow mask is very important and uh, the beams actually converge at the center of the shadow mask and then uh, cross over and hit the screen. Okay? This is probably a, a better arrangement. Uh, to show what actually was mean, being meant in the previous diagram in terms of it, uh, we have enlarged the shadow mask and also the CRT face. Uh, we are talking of a colored CRT electron gun and a shadow mask arrangement uh, for a colored CRT screen. So, left hand side the beam comes from the electron guns. Those guns are assumed to be there, but is not shown from the left hand side. We have the green beam, the blue beam and the red beam coming out from the respective electron guns. They intersect, the beams converge at the uh, perforation. This is basically a perforated sheet, so like a filter is what you can, but it is metallic. The shadow mask is typically metallic, a perforated sheet type of thing is what you can imagine, which has perforations or holes through which the beams are allowed to pass, uh, not arbitrarily anywhere. And uh, the beams converge there, of course, nothing happens, it just emanates out in a triangular arrangement once again and they will go and hit the corresponding red, green and blue phosphor dots on the CRT face as marked on the right hand side of the figure. The dashed arrow shows the corresponding dots on the screen. Uh, 
uh, as uh, R, G and B. Do, don't uh, uh, mistake yourself to visualize that the beam passes through the CRT phase and goes towards the letters R, G and B. No, those just, just they are uh, the markers shown. Those are the, in this case, the top one is the R and the right is the blue and the bottom one is the green respectively as the beams converge out of the shadow mask and hit the corresponding phosphor dots on the screen. So, I think this is uh, uh, an arrangement which shows you how uh, this is done. But if you look at the CRT phase itself, if you look at the CRT phase and how the triangular arrangements uh, uh, um, keep going, basically uh, what uh, it means is that we have a phosphor dot pattern of a shadow mask CRT and this is a CRT, of course the shadow mask uh, is in front of uh, you, do not worry about that. But the corresponding beams, the R, G and B, they come out of uh, uh, the shadow mask and hit those corresponding pixels which are shown by the color and then we have these, uh, it is shown by a circle. So, that circle is, uh, one such circle is a phosphor dot pattern, a phosphor dot basically and three of them form a triangle. So, there are three triangles shown, the top two corresponding to the uh, scan line number one let us say or the top scan line and similarly at the bottom we have another scan line which is also going and the RGB alternates basically. Okay? So, the same G could be used for the next one and so on. So, the beams have to be uh, changed uh, as, you, as, you, as you go along. Uh, uh, the PRG arrangement could become uh, becomes basically in the next pixel RGB and so on. So, this is how you probably save space. Otherwise, if you have to have separate triangles, non overlapping dots, the CRT uh, uh, have to be very large and you cannot make it very compact and high resolution within a particular dimension. Um, so, that you know you have a continuous picture. Otherwise, if you have large dots separated, you do not have a very continuous uh, feeling about the picture. So, for a very high resolution CRT, this is a typical arrangement of the phosphor dot pattern okay, on this screen. Okay, continuing with the n bit plane gray level frame buffer, we will come into more illustrations and pictures, but just a few points regarding the uh, bit planes and the colors. Typically, 8 bit planes per color is used. Okay? So, if you want to have full color for R, G and B separately, uh, we talked about three colors, each individual bit plane, but typically and we also talked about n bit plane gray level. So, why not have the n equal to 8 bit plane for each individual color? So, for R we can put 8 bits, okay? for G also 8 bits and the blue B also 8 bits. Okay? So, together you, you need basically 24 bits and uh, a 24 bit plane frame buffer with 8, pin, uh, 8 bit planes per color is also used. Okay? So, that is uh, the typical arrangement uh, uh, wh which is uh, desired and each group of bit planes which form corresponding to one particular color, it basically drives now an 8 bit DAC. So, it is getting a bit complicated, but we will try to see, I will give an illustration of the entire figure um, somehow, uh, because we talked about one bit plane and then of course, n equal to 8 and then 3 color guns with each uh, bit plane uh, for per color, but not talking about 8 bit planes per color, so 24 bit planes have to be put uh, inside the video controller as well as in the monitor to, to, to drive, to, to be driven by the video controller. Okay? Uh, each group generates now 256. 256 shades of intensities of red, green and blue. That means, you have 256 shades of red corresponding to dark and very red and similarly, you can have 256 shades of green and as well as 256 shades of blue and these are each group uh, which could generate that. Group means, we are talking about the 8 bit planes corresponding to a group and then an 8 bit register and then a corresponding uh, DAC which will be fired by the uh, register to generate different color intense beam intensities corresponding to different shades of colors. Okay? So, typically if you look at this, we talked of 2 to the power 3 equal to 8, 2 to the power 8 equal to 256. Now, we are talking of 2 to the power 24 possible colors. That is a very, very large number of colors. We are talking of about 16 million almost uh, and uh, that is the engineering standard which is used, 16 million colors and this is called a full color frame buffer. 16 million colors are there at your disposal and we call it a, as a full color color frame buffer. Now, before I go into the next slide, I must put a point here that uh, I am sure that whether it is an artist or a graphics page designer or a web page designer, in no way can visualize or even uh, you can say that it uh, he does not need, one does not need 16 million colors to draw any picture, however complex it is, how many sorts of colors you may need to display for a screen, either you are talking of a map or a 3D diagram or simple lines and textures and things like that, you typically, I do not think you need more than a few hundred. 
okay, few hundred colors uh, are in fact quite sufficient for you to display any complicated picture. Of course, we let us not, not go into algorithms about the selection of colors and all that. There are many such things uh, existing, but what we are talking about 16 million colors, impossible to even visualize. Uh, what uh, to distinguish between two such colors if I give you very adjacent ones just differing in one bit uh, with red, green and blue, uh, I do not think you can visualize. So, it is often necessary that the graphics designer or the um, artist whomsoever you talk about when an artist paints also with a color, he will make certain colors with again different shades uh, on his canvas and then you know use it to draw and uh, he probably does it with a, a few tens different types of colors and you draw it in layers and phases. When we look at color shading, we will see uh, there is a corresponding layer painters algorithm being talked about which uses the concept of what a painter does in terms of shading, but uh, really you need more than few tens or few hundred uh, color, couple of hundred colors, uh, different colors to do that. So, why do you need we talk about 24 bit full color frame buffer because it is also difficult to implement you do not need that. So, you will select a set of colors out of these and how to do that? How to do that? We go to the next slide to see the complexity involved in a 24 bit full color frame buffer as given here. So, we have three groups of 8 bit planes each, each for individually separate color on the left hand side then the frame buffer you see the black uh, colored frame buffers groups of 8 each group of 8 bit planes for red green and blue respectively okay so the corresponding bit values are loaded onto the 8 bit registers and this is a typical example the zeros and ones are shown uh, in binary and the corresponding decimal value for blue equal to 75 you can check it out yourself green equals 172 and the red is equal to 10 1010 that's 10 is also displayed. So, that means this is we are going to display a particular point with a color intensity where the red component will be 10 out of 256. You can take a fraction of that. Green is 172 also out of 256 and 75 out of 256. Basically, the programmer does not need to load values like this. It typically loads in a normalized range from 0 to 1. Okay, from 0 to 1 and the values are put onto the bit plane and then it is automatically loaded, loaded onto the uh, register which again drives an 8 bit DAC. Now, we need 3 8 bit DACs, 3 color guns, 3 8 bit registers, 24 bit plane. So, that is a huge demand on the bandwidth and uh, memory requirement and these color guns will of course, go and ignite that phosphor uh, dot triangle on the screen to eliminate this color. Now, yes, in this arrangement if you have typically uh, you will have uh, 16 million colors possible, but typically if you take a raster screen which is uh, of a maximum resolution about uh, uh, few hundred by few hundred or even take 1280 and by 1024 or uh, 1700 and all that. We are talking of the order of about 10 to the power 6 or uh, um, different pixels and even if you uh, uh, let us say uh, put each uh, like a random dot colored pattern each uh, different color on the thing you will not probably need 16 million colors and that is stupid you are not you are not talking about. Uh, 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 trying to put uh, a random dot color arrangement and show something that is ok. So, you need a different set of colors, you need uh, uh, definitely a fixed set of colors to draw any arbitrary picture and do not you do not need to worry about 2 to the power 24 colors what will you select ok. So, to handle the uh, to make the life of the programmer easier that he does not have to worry about 16 million colors which to choose from we use what and a concept of what is called a lookup table within the frame buffer ok uh, just before the frame buffer. Okay, but it basically sits between the frame buffer and the uh, registers. Okay, so lookup table or LUT or LUT as it is called, we talk of an n bit plane gray level color frame buffer with w bit wide LUT or lookup table or LUT as it is called. There are different pronunciations, but I will use the word LUT uh, corresponding as given here or a LUT. Uh, and uh, uh, what this basically means? What does the uh, not do. And typically, the, the value of W is much, much more than N. Okay? Typically, that does not mean of course, that if you are choosing uh, a 24 bit plane, you know, uh, W goes more than that, that is not the key. Let us try to visualize what will happen if N is equal to 8. Okay? N equal to 8, try to visualize and W could be more than 8, it could be 12, 16, 24 up to that, you do not need more than 24. So, W could be 24 at the maximum, N less than W is what you have to visualize. The n bit register which will load the contents of the frame buffer onto the n bits of the register, the content of that, that means the corresponding byte value which will come out of the register that acts as an index. Okay? Index, I hope you understand in terms of memory address, index to the lookup table. So, you can visualize lookup table as a sort of sequence of memory positions and uh, uh, how to address the corresponding position in the memory address. 
depends upon the index uh, pointed out by the register or uh, from the lookup table and uh, that index will be used to uh, access the corresponding contents of the lookup table. Okay. Thus, if we have this arrangement, we will put the figure now, thus out of 2 to the power w possible intensities because the lookup table if it is w bit wide can hold obviously 2 to the power w possible values or 2 to the power w uh, possible intensities and that is what it is available and out of that only 2 to the power n different intensities are usable at any point of time. Why? Because that is what will be loaded inside the frame buffer. The frame buffer is n bit wide, so you will have 2 to the power n possible values, the lookup table has 2 to the power w possible values. So, you can at any given point of time choose 2 to the power n uh, usable values out to out of 2 to the power w possible intensities. Remember w is more than n, so 2 to the power w possible values is much larger than 2 to the power n uh, values which can be loaded in the frame buffer, but you could choose which of those 2 to the power w intensities or values of color you would like to use and choose them and load the frame buffer. So, this is why uh, this is how the lookup table helps uh, basically in uh, uh, helps the programmer to choose his colors efficiently and without bothering about a very large uh, value. Okay. So, that is what I was saying the last point the programmer must choose 2 to the power n different intensities based on his requirement and load the LUT or the lookup table which is addressable position in memory like we talked about frame buffer which is addressable, uh, the LUT is also addressable and that has to be loaded before use. Okay. So, that has to be loaded before use. Well, we look at the diagram of n bit pin gray level frame buffer with a w bit wide lookup table. Okay. The overall arrangement in a simplistic situation I have taken a simple example so that first of all the, the uh, scenario looks uh, simple and of course, uh, fitted on a particular screen itself. We are talking of a n bit uh, frame buffer n is equal to 3 simple case we have chosen. We remember we got the EGA 8 different colors possible. So, now 2 to the power 3 n 8 different possible intensities you can use the or the programmer can use. And then the question is he may need only 8, but which 8 out of many? I mean you can choose 8 out of 2 to the power uh, 24 or 16 million colors, but he is happy with the 8, he does not need more than 8 is what we assume. So, the contents of the frame buffer are loaded onto a 3 bit wide register and that register contents now act as a you see a pointer to the lookup table from the register. From the register when n equal to 3 is written, there is a pointer to the lookup table. So, the contents now the value is uh, uh, let us say in this case uh, uh, 2, so 0, 1, 2, so it is pointing to the third row starting from 0 the count 0, 1 and 2 it is pointing to the third row of the lookup table which has a value, value 1, 0, 1, 1. What is that value? 8 plus 3 equals 11 that is ok, but what I mean is the, the contents of the register are acting as an index or a pointer to the lookup table entries and we, the corresponding third row the third content will be picked out from the lookup table which is w bit wide. Now, this is interesting register was 3 bit wide 8 possible values, but w is 4 bit wide. So, 2 to the power uh, 4 or in fact you may have 2 to the power uh, uh, no I am sorry out of 2 to the power 4 possible values the lookup table number of entries will be only 2 to the power n because that is what the register can access. The register with the 3 bit wide or n bit wide cannot access more than 2 to the power n entries or 0 to 2 to the power n minus 1. So, th those means so basically I have this lookup table with 8 entries because n is equal to 3, 2 to the power 8, uh, 2 to the power 3 is equal to 8 and 0 to 7. So, there are 8 uh, entries in this lookup table, but each is 4 bit wide that is very interesting each is 4 bit wide and uh, this contents is 11 which is coming out from the third uh, uh, location pointed to by the register and the lookup table output goes to 2 to the power w DAC that is interesting. Now, the DAC instead of being 2 to the power n b to wide is basically uh, to the, uh, uh, having capacity of 0 to 2 to the power n will have different levels from 0 to 2 to the power w. So, it has more number of capacity than what the frame buffer can access and that is an advantage because now 2 to the power 4 16. So, out of 16 possible intensities you choose your 8 that the programmer chooses his 8 possible intensities whatever he needs for to draw his picture or um, uh, color and then loads the corresponding 8 positions of the lookup table with only those intensities. So, the programmer a priori knows where is the color which he requires in what position uh, the in the lookup table his desired color is any desired color. 8 desired colors out of 16. So, he chooses 8 out of 16, loads the lookup table with the corresponding 8 entries and access it by a 
register. So that picture uh, I hope is very clear to you and the lookup table output goes to 2 to the power W DAC and uh, the DAC gives a corresponding analog voltage intensity, analog voltage let us say which is proportional uh, to the input uh, to the DAC. So out of 16 possible values he can uh, although he gets in 8 but it has the capacity to give any uh, output up from 0 to 15 although there are 8 possible values. So, electron gun of course, the CRT the rest part of it is, is very simple. So, this is a typical arrangement you uh, hope you understand from the figure about an n bit plane gray level frame buffer with a w bit wide lookup table previously we did not use this lookup table. What would have happened without a lookup table? Yes, the n bit contents of the register would have directly gone to a t 2 to the power n DAC directly from the register it would have been driven to a DAC and you would have had a 2 to the power n DAC and you would have had only 8 possible intensities. Uh, but fixed 8 intensities at any point of time and that is what the electron gun is able to fire and what you can choose. Now, you can choose any 8 out of 16. In fact, increase W, take W equal to 8. If you take W equal to 8, what you are visualizing? Well, the size of the local table in terms of its content entries will be could be still 8 that depends on the value n which is 3, but you can now choose those 8 colors from 256 colors because W is 8 bit wide. So, there are 256 possible color values or gray level intensities and you can choose just 8 out of 256 and load the lookup table and, uh, uh, and address just uh, the corresponding 8 and uh, you will then use a 2 to the power W DAC which needs because the output will be a W bit wide from the lookup table. So, you need a 2 to the power W DAC not 2 to the power N to fire the electron gun. Okay? So, we are talking of 2 to the power W intensity levels 2 to the power N at a time when uh, w is more than n. If you look at the bottom left of your screen, that is just a comment which we are just discussing now. We are talking of 2 to the power w intensity levels, 2 to the power n at any given point of time. Now, if we can change the lookup table contents, those 2 to the power n which are accessible, those uh, values could change. 2 to the power n, that number remains constant, but what the entries in the lookup table could get changed and you can any given point or you can have basically two pictures with two different lookup tables on a particular screen uh, having two entirely two different set of colors chosen by the programmer. Okay. Now, the most complex scene is what we are looking at a 24 bit plane color frame buffer with a 10 bit wide lookup table. Well, I cannot put all that here, but what we are looking here is uh, 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 we are looking at n equal to uh, 8 because 24 bit. Uh, so, 8 into 3 is 24, n bit uh, wide assume n equal to 8. So, we have a 24 bit plane uh, groups of 8 bit planes as you can see on the left hand side, one for red, one for green, one for blue and each is n bit wide. The contents are put to a horizontal register here. This is the register for red, that is the register for green and that is the register for blue. Those registers are all n bit wide. In this case again, uh, since it is 24 bit plane, we are talking about n could be equal, n is equal to 8, but you can take even uh, uh, a typical case of n equal to 4. So, we are talking of about maybe 12 bit then. Okay. So, do, does not matter. What, what it basically means is we are talking of uh, n bit wide register n in this case is 8 let us say. And then, so we have 2 to the power n entries for each color set for the frame buffer. Frame buffer each group for each individual color consider only R, only green or only blue any one of the three colors. We have n bit planes for R let us say we have an n bit register for the red and the contents of the n bit register are fed as an entry to the lookup table. So, you are looking at any one out of the 256 possible entries in the lookup table because 2 to the power n we have taken n to be 8. So, 2 to the power 8 256 entries are there in the lookup table for each channel similarly for red, similarly for green, similarly for W that is an example of a color uh, lookup table here. Uh, and one uh, this is a lookup table for blue on the right hand side, middle we have a lookup table for green and the left hand side bottom we have the lookup table for red. <coughs> it is not necessary that W should be equal to N. We talked about this earlier. In this case we have assumed that the lookup table is 10 bit wide, W equal to 10 in all these cases, red, green and blue. That means what? We are looking at intensities of 2 to the power N which is about 1024, 1 meg. Okay, 1024 possible intensities out of 1024 possible intensities of red separately, green separately and blue separately. That means, the darkest value of the red or any color up to the brightest value of a particular color that entire range is now split into 1024 different quantum levels or discrete steps. 
is what you can imagine from 0, 1, 2 up to 1024 minus 1 or 1023. So, out of 1024 possible values, where is this 1024 coming from? Well, w equal to 10, 2 to the power 10. So, that is the way it comes out. Uh, 1024 or 1k, I am sorry, I, I talked about 1 make, 1k values. Out of those 1k possible values, which the uh, 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 which you can assign onto the lookup table, the programmer a priori chooses 256 or 2 to the power 8 possible values and loads the lookup table. Okay, so you choose y 256 again, 2 to the power n. As we look into the figure, 256 possible entries, but each entry 10 bit wide. Each entry 10 bit wide will be one color, red, green and blue, one color obviously, but the shade of that color will be one out of 1024 possible values, 2 to the power 10, 2 to the power w as we are talking. So, out of one out of 1024 values will be loaded in the each entry of the lookup table and there are only 256 such, such possible values in one lookup table, shades of red, shades of green and shades of blue respectively. So, these are the three different shades which we are talking about uh, uh, for uh, three different reds and now you can imagine these lookup table contents will be now passed onto the electronic gun. I could not put it all in one slide. If you look back into the slide again, it runs from the 24 bit plane to the, uh, um, uh, if, you re if you recollect the uh, picture which was just shown, uh, then we are looking at uh, 24 bit plane to the what w bit white lookup table okay so when you move to the next slide when you move to the next slide uh, uh, it is a continuation of the previous picture okay so i hope you are able to see the next slide uh, and uh, we are looking at a 24 bit uh, plain color frame buffer with a 10 bit wide lookup tables and uh, for this uh, yes now you can see the picture i i will uh, show the continuity of the picture i'll go back to the previous slide so, we are looking from a 24 bit plane frame buffer to a lookup table and from lookup table now we are seeing the remaining part of the picture because if I had condensed this 2 into 1 picture things would have been too small for you to visualize what is going on. So, this is a continuity. Okay, So, uh, we stopped in the previous slide with the lookup tables. Now, the lookup table contents which is being addressed by the corresponding register 1 out of the 2 to the power n or 256 positions one such content will be dragged out like a memory address and then a memory contents are taken out and it is passed on to a w bit wide DAC. Okay, w bit wide digital to analog converter, three DACs again for three separate colors R, G and B or red, green and blue and the DAC contents are again output to the corresponding red, green, blue colors and they are all converged to a single pixel a phosphor triangular phosphor dot arrangement for RGB in a single raster plane. Okay. So, I hope this arrangement is uh, getting clear. I will just roll back one slide back and forth for you to visualize the continuity. Uh, these two slides from one picture uh, basically we have taken this from the uh, book by Rogers. So, we are talking from a 24 bit flame color frame buffer and then we are talking about 10 bit wide, we have an n bit wide register sitting in between three registers for each color, three lookup tables for separate colors. Then from the three corresponding lookup tables, yes, the next picture is we feed it to the corresponding three DACs, each w bit wide, then we have again the three color guns, three color guns generate the corresponding intensities, they all fire onto the CRT raster. Okay. So, this is the probably the uh, last slide. Uh, which we uh, look in terms of CRT display monitors. To wind up the remaining uh, part of the lecture on display devices, we may not come back to that again. I thought we had ex done extensively a discussion on CRT monitors, specifically do with the raster refresh, video scan, basic refresh rate, memory access architectures. We looked at uh, uh, the arrangement of guns, lookup tables and all that which is necessary and uh, and those are the common display devices which are used the monitor ones. Okay, And there of course, there are other types of display devices which I gave at the beginning about uh, three classes back and I uh, think we must just touch upon a few points about uh, the other modern days display devices which are coming out in terms of the uh, consistently as you see uh, almost on the screen the TV of course. Uh, is a monitor based, but uh, we started to having the LCD panels or the flat panels uh, display monitors, uh, which uh, uh, are different. They have some advantages uh, with respect to the CRT monitor. So, I thought we will wind up this discussion with a few points about LCD uh, and flat panel displays. Okay. So, LCD or a liquid crystal display device is made up of basically six layers. The first of them is a vertical polarizer plane, then the second layer is a layer of thin grid wires 
and uh, the third is a layer of the liquid crystals which is in the heart or in the kernel or the center of the displays and then again a layer of horizontal grid wires then of course again a horizontal polarizer as the fifth layer and finally a reflector. So, that are made up of six layers the crucial part are the two polarizers and the layer of LCDs in between I think that is what uh, causes the LCDs to function uh, it glows or it becomes dark ok. So, the LCD material is made up of long crystalline molecules ok. So, when the uh, crystals are in in an electric field they all line up in the same direction. So, there is some uh, is more to do with uh, devices and uh, technology of materials. So, we assume for the time being uh, we do not have much time to go into details uh, uh, for this course. So, uh, touching upon it LCD material is made up of long crystalline molecules and the crystals line up in the same direction when an electric field is applied ok. Uh, the active, mat active matrix panel that is also a term which is used for all these uh, uh, basically flat panel displays and um, also LCDs occasionally active mat active matrix panels have a transistor at each grade point x comma y at each position and crystals are dialed up to provide the color. So, you can have LCD color uh, monitors as well and the transistors basically act also as a memory because uh, they also cause the crystals to change their state quickly and hold on to that voltage till the transistor state uh, stage is uh, switched back again. Okay. And the advantage of LCD displays you can almost imagine they are there in your calculators and palm tops, desktops and you know even on the uh, uh, controls of uh, um, uh, sometimes on TVs, air conditioners, handheld devices like uh, cell phone, mobile units and all that. So, LCD displays are very low cost, they are low weight, they are of small in size and they have a very low power consumption as well ok. Continuing with that the display contains uh, two polarizers in fact, we talked about six layers and the uh, task mainly is done by the two polarizers and the LCD uh, crystals in between and the two polarizers align 90 degree to each other we talked of horizontal and as well as as vertical polarizers and with the display in its off condition or its off state the light entering the display is plain polarized by the first polarizer ok. Uh, when, the, when the display is in off state the light entering the display is polarized by the first polarizer then what happens this polarized light passes through the liquid crystal sandwich ok. So, we are talking of layers in between liquid crystals are sandwich and then through the second polarizer and is reflected back to the display. So, in fact, when the display is off the light is allowed to pass through these layers pass through the first polarizer the sandwich layers of crystals in between and also to the second polarizer which is uh, the if it is horizontal then you have the vertical one and the light is allowed to go and fall on the display and we see the portion of the LCD illuminated ok illuminated or it is enlightened ok. Well, when turning the pixel on means it is done by basically applying an electric field causes the crystal to untwist ok the crystal changes its position or state and that causes something else because the light now passing through the liquid crystal sandwich is absorbed by the second polarizer. In the previous case it was allowed to go through in the second case it is absorbed by the second polarizer and the pixel starts to appearing dark. So, dark and light is what is controlled by the corresponding transistor or the electric field uh, by switching the state of the crystal ok uh, in terms of twisting and untwisting it. So, that is the logic which you must just keep in mind. One has to study extensively about uh, uh, LCD panels by opening manuals and books to understand the technology behind it. Well, uh, just again we are going into introductions of these uh, basically uh, displays are of two types uh, plasma gas discharge uh, and uh, electro luminescent we are talking of flat panel displays um, they could be of two types all flat panel displays are all flat panel displays are raster refresh displays. We talked of raster displays at length in terms of the CRT monitors uh, or CRT monitors uh, and uh, all flat panel displays are also of the CRT uh, are like the CRT monitors they are the ra refresh raster type ok. So, we continue and uh, a flat CRT unlike the monitor where you have a big arrangement of uh, the electronic gun the anode uh, heating element and then of course, the horizontal deflection plates control grids focusing unit uh, either electromagnetic coil to reflect the voltage or analog or uh, deflection plates horizontal and vertical and then the beam courses through the shadow mask has to fall on the phosphor coated screen and dots all that of arrangement uh, makes the CRT look very big you can see the uh, uh, TVs 
uh, are the uh, monitors with, with the uh, CRT. If it is inside a CRT, it has to be big and voluminous because of this. And uh, there are other problems because it increases the weight of the system. There is heat generation uh, wherever it works and also it occupies space, volume and all that. Okay? A flat CRT has a very big advantage that uh, it is sleek because and flat because uh, the, the flat CRT is obtained by initially projecting the beam parallel to the screen and reflecting it to 90 degrees. So, typically uh, when you are watching a uh, screen a flat panel, the uh, unlike the electron beam for a CRT monitor which just directly goes almost perpendicularly to the phosphor screen and then is deviated and imp uh, impinges on a phosphor dot on the screen, it is other way around that the beam is basically running almost vertically uh, along the screen and then diverted and hits the particular point on the screen, it is reflected. And, uh, uh, by 90 degrees and hits the hits the screen. So, that is the advantage of why it is slick. Reflection of electronic beam, it is done by of course, uh, um, optical uh, devices, uh, um, uh, electro optical devices, reduces the depth of the CRT bottle and also the display. Okay? So, that is that is obvious and the plasma display like the LCDs are also active matrix displays. Okay? They are also called uh, the uh, active matrix displays here and the required voltage or current to control the pixel illumination is supplied using a thin film transistor or diode. That is a technology which is used uh, to control the pixel illumination. Uh, we require uh, because you need to control the intensity also there correct? along with the color. So, that is done by a thin film transistor or, or diode. Okay. So, that is uh, this brings us to the end of the uh, lectures on uh, CRT display devices. We had a sequence of four uh, um, hours of uh, the four classes or four lectures, and we have discussed extensively about CRT monitors because that's what the basic target. You should know about the technology, and we touched upon a few points about LCD panels and flat panel display monitors. There are other uh, types of output devices, of course, which we may not touch. Input devices like the keyboard and the mouse, we talked about, um, and of course, output devices like plotters and printers and all that. But with respect to the time allotted, I think I'll move over to algorithms and other concepts on graphics. Um, and uh, if we, and uh, you have to bear with me that I couldn't uh, talk at much length about other interface and other input-output devices used in computer graphics. And uh, I spend most of the time on CRT display devices and touched upon flat panel devices. Well, I have made uh, at the end of each lecture a set of questions which uh, you should try to solve it yourself, answer yourself uh, and even there are some problems given in each of these and they will be uh, shown at the end of the each slide and please go back uh, learn more from the books and references which have been quoted in the introduction slide and try to solve these problems. Yeah, although uh, we said that uh, you could solve all the problems at home. We will discuss a few selected set of problems right now and uh, we will choose uh, one problem from each particular task. So, uh, kindly choose uh, one such problem from the take home task 1. Can we discuss task 1 fourth problem? Yeah, that is nice. Uh, that says that the uh, average time to execute an instruction in the display list is about 33.3 microseconds and if the frame rate is 30 frames per second, uh, the problem says obtain the maximum number of instructions that may be present in the display list for random scan displays. If you remember random scan displays was basically uh, a line drawing uh, uh, display device and it had in the display list a set of instructions. So, it is a sequence of instructions which are basically executed one after the another and we want to find out what is maximum number of instructions which could be placed. So, to solve the problem, let us come here. Uh, the problem says that we have a frame rate of about 30 hertz, that is the frame rate and from that we can easily obtain the time to scan one frame, correct. Uh, the time to scan one frame multiplied by the, uh, the uh, frame rate or that is the number of frames per second, FPS or hertz, it gives one second. So, time to scan is 1 by that value which is 1 by 30 seconds or 33 point 3 milliseconds, 33.3 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 3 that is engineering unit milliseconds. And hence, since the problem states that the time to execute an instruction is only 33, 33.33 microseconds. Okay? So, that is 10 to the power minus 6 unit here and uh, time to you have actually uh, 10 to the power minus 3. Uh, the unit here for one frame. So, total number of instructions 
we should be this divided by this the so 33.3 cancels out and the answer is very easy you can obtain that you can actually put 1000 frames per second. So that is the uh, very easy to compute the, uh, the answer is 1000 microsecond. Let us go to another question. Sir can we discuss task 2 third problem. Task 2 third problem that is good. Well you see that uh, this is something to do with the resolution of the screen. If you remember when we are talking about resolution of the screen uh, there are concepts of frame buffer, uh, bandwidth and scan rate and things like that. But the actual resolution which is there on the monitor it depends on the pixel size, physical dimension of the pixel size. So let us look at this problem. So that is where in this case. Although this problem is very easy, we said that let us say if you have a video monitor where the size is uh, 12 inch in width and 9.6 in height okay, and we had said that along this we have 1280. Okay. So we have basically want to put 1280 pixels along each. 1280 pixels along each row okay, and each row will be 1280 and the total number uh, or 1280 columns basically 1280 columns and the number of rows is 1024. So there are 1024 rows and 1280 columns of pixels that means the row width uh, is basically 1280 and the height of a column is 1024. So either way we can visualize it or you can also say that the number of columns is 1280, number of rows is 1024. That means each pixel, I have a small pixel here that is you know it is arranged in the, we assume that for the time being that they are arranged in the form of a matrix okay and there are 1280 such thick in the horizontal direction, x direction let us say and in the y direction 1024 and the question is how many such uh, pixels we can pack it depends upon the physical dimension and uh, so number of uh, pixels multiplied by each unit gives this. So we can say that if uh, each such uh, unit is of uh, width w, each is of width w then, then we will say w multiplied by 1280 gives you actually 12 inches and which in turn basically tells you that w that is the width will be actually 12 inches by 1280 okay that is very simple and that uh, answer is about uh, 9.4 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 3 inches okay. So that is the you can actually get this value also uh, by dividing 9.6 by 1024 correct you will also actually get this value you can see feel for yourself that is almost close to 1000 9.6 here. So the value will be little bit numerically less than 9.6 it will be 9.4 uh, into 10 to the power minus 3. So that is the width and the height for each individual pixel. So that is the, uh, the way you compute the uh, size okay. Let us go to the next. Uh, so course. in task 3 can we discuss the first question ask the first question as said here we are asked to compute the refresh uh, I am sorry we are asked to compute the access time for each pixel for systems which have two different resolutions as given there one is 640 multiplied by 480 the other is 60 uh, um, and 1280 by 1024 is the other resolution and the refresh rate is 60 frames per second. So let us take uh, task 3 and uh, problem 1 and we are taking off a resolution A. So we are talking of a resolution which is 640 multiplied by 480 that is the uh, image resolution or screen resolution also you can say. I will better put it as screen resolution. Okay. And we are talking of a refresh rate of 60 hertz or 60 frames.
frames per second. I did teach you that you can use these terms interchangeably. Hertz means per second or FPS is frames per second. Okay. So if that is the uh, frames per second, so uh, time to scan, time for one uh, frame scan or basically meaning scanning one frame, time required to scan one frame, I write it as time for one frame scan is basically 1 by 60, okay. how much 1 by 60 comes? Okay. It will come in about 80, 16, about 16.7 milliseconds. Okay. You can check it out yourself, it will come to about approximately 16.67 or 16.7 milliseconds. Is that correct? 16.67. 16.67, I round it off to 16.7, okay. that is good. Okay. Now, uh, we are talking about, so in 16.7 milliseconds, it must access so many pixels, 640 multiplied by 480 pixels must be accessed in 16.7 milliseconds. So, time to access one pixel. is actually you can do, take this 16.7 divided by 640 multiplied by 480 so many milliseconds okay if you divide this and compute yourself you will you can check the answer it should be 50 it will come to about 54 microseconds it will come to about 54 microseconds, 54 microseconds. Now, this value uh, of 54 microsecond includes actually the time for vertical retrace. That means, you know, individually accessing all the pixels from uh, left to right per row in the, and then for second row, third row and all, all that and then you need to have time for retrace, both horizontal and vertical retrace times. Actually, if you take into account that time, which typically takes about 17 percent, about 17 percent of the time, then you will be left over with about 0 0.83, 0 0.83 of, uh, uh, of the time. So, this value, this value of 54 microseconds will actually, you need to probably put a multiplying factor of about 0 0.83, okay. so assuming 17 percent of the time is gone for retrace per frame in out of the 16.7 uh, milliseconds. So, you will left be over, you will be left over with 0 0.83 of that time. If it is 15 percent for retrace, then you will have 0 0.85. Okay. So, that value goes down by some amount, it will typically, you can calculate for yourself 54, it will come to about, uh, uh, about 42 microseconds or so. You can check it out yourself, uh, how that uh, the value is. Can you check that out? We can check it out right now. Yeah, it comes to about 40, 45 precisely, about you can round it off, the value comes to about 45 microseconds. So, that is the part A of the problem and I will overwrite in a similar way the part B says that uh, uh, the resolution is increased, the resolution is increased to 1280 multiplied by 1024. So, we will move into the second part of the problem of task 3 problem 1, where the resolution now is 1280 multiplied by 1024 keeping the refresh rate per same, time to access for one second is also same okay. and we keep that factor of 0 0.83 here. Okay. I think I can rub it off and write again neatly. So, I will say that uh, 0 0.83 multiplied by 16.7 milliseconds divided by 1280 multiplied by 1024. Okay. You can have a calculator yourself, you can check it out. It comes to 10.5. It comes to, now you can see that the bandwidth requirement is probably so large now. Okay. It is already 
um, and this is the time to access per pixel we talked about bandwidth requirement now where within this time to access per pixel it has to go on we has to go switch on switch off so we are talking about almost about 5 microseconds of access time we are talking about almost about uh, the bandwidth requirement requirement of 1 MB 1 meg 1 megahertz type of uh, bandwidth is what you are requiring at this uh, but of course there are higher resolution monitors also available higher frame rates and you can start to visualize the amount of time in which the beam has to switch on and switch off access a particular pixel will be still going down further and further okay yes can we discuss some other problem we just have time task four first problems yes that's a very interesting uh, problem task four Problem 1, thank you. Assuming a transfer rate of 0.1 megabyte per second, so we are talking about a transfer rate of about 0.1 megabyte per second, which I will almost take it approximately equal to 100, and 100 kilobyte per second. It is not true, but it is an approximation. 1 mega meg is about 1024, so it should have actually come to 102 kilobyte per second. You are you can actually take that and then how much time would be necessary to load pix maps with resolution so the first problem talks about 512 multiplied by 512 into 1 so many bits it is in bits that is in bytes so to transfer this into bytes i must divide it by 8 so so many bytes have to be transferred okay so many bytes have to be transferred and the rate is known as 100 kilobyte per second so if you calculate this you are basically the time taken requirement so in one second or 100 kilobyte you can transfer in one second so it, this actually comes to uh, you can calculate yourself it comes to about 32 this is actually about 32 kilobytes you can check it out yourself because um, uh, if it, it this 512 divided by 8 will actually give you 2 to the power uh, uh, 5 or 2 to the power 6 so uh, you will have 2 to the power uh, 5 here and one term going here to make, take care of the kilobytes so 2 to the power 6 is what you get you basically get 32 kilobytes you need to be transferred 100 kilobyte in one second so in 32 kilobyte the time required will be about 0 0.31 seconds 0 0.31 second okay so that is the uh, answer for the first part I will quickly overwrite the answers with the second part if I say the second part that is the part B has 1024 and 1280 uh, that is the large more or less the larger monitor 1024 multiplied by 1280 divided by 8 so many bytes have to be transferred and uh, this uh, typically goes to about uh, uh, you can check it out for yourself actually it will come to about 157 kilobytes okay check that you can you have to basically transfer the bytes to kilobytes you can so you can compare if in 100 kilobytes you have you can transfer in one second so 157 kilobytes you need the answer is very easy 1.5 seconds so that is the answer that is the answer 1.5 second is the answer which I have okay thank you much you should try the rest of the other problems which are given in the uh, take home tasks thank you very much.